Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the 10th Annual National Agenda Speaker Series. This year's theme calls attention to the power of us, the citizens of the United States. Even in this tumultuous time, our right to vote in elections remains one of the most important acts we can perform as Americans. And I'm pleased to announce that our voter registration competition, which you can follow at sites.udel.edu slash students vote, just started yesterday and broke our single day turbo vote sign up by receiving nearly 700 signups. So make sure you check that out and get registered to vote. This competition continues until September 22nd, which is National Voter Registration Day. Tonight is our first national agenda without boundaries. And throughout the fall, we'll address many tough questions. But we're also here to provide a little levity and entertainment. That's why tonight, be prepared to have a laugh or two as we talk about political satire and political humor in a pandemic. Finally, even though we're virtual, we'll be still inviting audience participation to submit a question, type your question into chat, and it may be selected to be asked during our Q&A at the end of this talk. I'm Dr. Lindsay Hoffman. Thank you for being here. And I'm excited to announce that tonight, when a group of friends dropped out of college and started a fake newspaper, they didn't realize it would be one of the most popular humor destinations in the world decades later. The Onion's founder and longest serving editor in chief is also a best selling author whose work has won the Thurber Prize for American Humor, a Peabody, and over 30 Webby Awards. Please welcome The Onion's Scott Dickers. Hi, everybody. It's so nice to be here with all of you. Hi, Scott. Um, thank you, Lindsay. Thank you for joining us virtually. And welcome to yeah. the nearly 600 folks on this webinar from Delaware to North Dakota to Costa Rica. All in all, our viewers join us from 19 states and four countries and comprise UD alumni, faculty, staff, retirees, and students, as well as many not affiliated with UD. Thank you to all of you for joining us tonight. So Scott, Let's get started. Tell us a little about your decades long journey with political satire and The Onion. Yeah, so uh, to make that story very short, I'll try to compact 30 years into, uh, into a quick answer. But when, I, when The Onion started, uh, it seemed like media especially, but kind of the world in general uh, was going to hell in a handbasket. And now, I mean, everybody seems to agree the world is going to hell in a handbasket. The world is crazier than anything a satirist could invent. And it seems like even when we make things up to try to be as crazy as possible, um, it ends up coming true. Like so many things that we write in, in The Onion have, have come true. And even crazier than that, people believe they're, they're real before they come true. So it's so crazy that even though everything in the onion is made up, that we're in a, in a state now where uh, for a lot of people, it's indistinguishable from what's really happen, happening. So, you know, we've all seen those surveys, young people get their news primarily from comedy now, um, or fake news, like that's, fake news is a term that was invented by The Daily Show to define the type of comedy that they were doing. And this is a lot of people's primary news source. You know, they, they have to create the context of their comedy so they tell you what's going on uh, in the news. And then those same people don't trust the traditional news media because uh, traditional news media has just become infotainment and uh, it's not really doing news anymore. So where do you go? Like, where do you go to get information? TV used to be a public service where networks would provide news and information to educate the citizenry. <laughs> Imagine that. So now, you know, we have obvious propaganda masquerading as satire that they call fake news. That's what we all heard about during the 2016 election. People just putting out lies to try to sway voters and they called it satire or they called it fake news and people confused uh, the two. And furthermore, they believed that it was true. Um, you know, and online especially, people are not good at distinguishing, distinguishing what's real from what's fake. And so 
they get into a rabbit hole of conspiracy theories. They go on Facebook and Facebook and Google are designed to feed people more of what they already want. So if you, if you like a story about how COVID-19 was invented by Martians to prevent you from getting laid, you're gonna get more of that. And you're just gonna go deeper in that echo chamber. And worse, ultimately, is you're gonna vote. So our political leaders get dumber and dumber. And it's just a, spy, it's just a downward spiral. And so, you know, how did this happen? How, how did we get to this place? I guess I should cop to it. It's my fault. Like, The Onion was the first in a long series of news parody publications and the TV shows that it inspired that do satire. And, you know, a lot of people from The Onion went and worked on those shows. So it's all kinds of kind of stems from what we did. So I'm very sorry. I want to apologize <laughs> uh, for the sad state of our national news media. It's my fault. Fox News is my fault. All the blame. <laughs> all the blame. And MSNBC, my fault. Donald Trump, my fault. The fires in California, my fault. Climate change, sorry. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I didn't know this would happen when these two very enterprising UW Madison students came to me in 1988 and invited me to be a part of this idea they had to start a college humor publication. Um, I just thought it sounded like a fun idea. And it started as just this campus rag, 15,000 circulation, and students liked it. And we were just trying to be funny. And we could only afford to print on newsprint. So fake news kind of became our format, just uh, form followed function. Um, I'm sorry, function followed form. So we, um, we did like weekly world news parody stuff at first. And then over the years, we kind of figured out the finer points of satire and started lampooning the news media itself just by the nature of the medium that we were working in. Um, and I can tell you more about it, but that's basically, um, uh, I think that answer is your, that's a long answer. I, I promised I'd do the short answer. I did the long answer. No, so, no. I just wanted to hear more about kind of how you got here, um, how you got yeah. started and, um, what your thoughts are, but apparently you just think that you're to blame for every, all the ills of the world. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, well, you know, I'm in the comedy business and we take things very seriously. <laughs> we, and we take personal responsibility. But, you know, it's, it started, like I said, with us tr just trying to be funny. And so a lot of our humor in the beginning was very sophomoric. Um, and we did some political stuff. I remember a story we did that was on the front page. It was... Uh, governor proclaims November masturbation month. And it was about Governor Thompson, Tommy Thompson of Wisconsin. And this is one of the first times we actually got in trouble for what we were printing, kind of put us on the map in that, in that regard. But I needed a photo of the governor for this story. So I called um, his office and I spoke to his press secretary who had heard of the onion and he refused to give me a photo because he knew that we would just make fun of the governor. So I was stumped. I didn't know where to go. I thought like that you were supposed to get a free photo of the governor if you were a citizen. They owed you that, you know, the standard politician mugshot or whatever. But they wouldn't give it to me. And so I went to, and it, you couldn't just go online to get photos then. This is all like analog. Right, but right. I had to find a physical photo. So I went to the local newspaper in town and they had a huge file of photos of the governor they had a great picture of him at a podium, you know, going like this, which was perfect for the masturbation story. And so I used that photo, I put it on the front page. And for kicks, I put in really small letters on the side of the photo, uh, the name of the press secretary that I had spoken to. It said special thanks to John Hankus, that was his name. So as a little dig. <laughs> And when that issue hit the streets, I got a really angry phone call from John Hankus, who apparently got his head bitten off by the governor, blamed him for giving us the photo. And uh, they tried to sue us. They, they actually prevented us from getting a big advertiser for a long time. They really wanted to crush us because we had been so mean to them. And they demanded a retraction. And 
you know, in those days it was like, we we're just doubling down on the, on the funny. So in the next issue, we put a little box that said, uh, last week, the onion erroneously reported that the governor had proclaimed November masturbation month. It was an error. Uh, he had in fact proclaimed it sodomy month. Uh, the onion regrets the error. And special thanks to John Hankins for pointing out this correction. So, you know, that was sort of, sort of the college antics that would happen on occasion at the onion when it was still small and it was just a local thing. And when nobody knew about it, those were sort of the adventures that we had. I'm sure none of the college students on this call can relate to any of that kind of humor. <laughs> no. All right. So let's get started. So you teach and write books about how to be funny. That's been kind of your, your renaissance. So define funny for us. What makes something truly funny? Yeah, there's a lot of people who have theories and there's, I keep running into these people and they write books like um, where they try to compress it into like a simple formula or whatever. And it's a, it's a little more complicated than that. But for me, something is funny when there's subtext that is some opinion or value judgment that the humorist or comedian or comedy writer has that they're trying to communicate to the audience. But instead of saying it on the nose, just saying what their opinion is, they filter it through one or more of 11 different, what I call funny filters. So these are the essential tools of humor that can make any opinion into a joke. And uh, let, let's see if I can remember them all um, off the top of my head there. So um, there's irony, where you say the opposite of what you think. There's character, where you use an invented comedic archetype or character to communicate what you're trying to say. There's reference, where you relate um, an observational or ex daily experience that most people can relate to, a, a reference to something in the world. Um, There's hyperbole, where you exaggerate to an absurd degree, an illogical degree. There's shock, where you swear or use sex or violence or some other sort of shocking element. That kind of communicates to people that it's a joke, um, but you can't go too far with that because it's kind of diminishing returns. Uh, wordplay is where you play with words in a way different than their definitions. There is uh, parody, which is what The Onion is, where you mock the form of something else. The Onion mocks a news organization, but you can parody other things. You can parody movies, TV shows, or anything that's meant for entertainment or information, you can parody. You can parody a, parody a, a restaurant menu if you want to. Um, there's analogy, where you compare two disparate things. That's kind of a complicated one, but everyone has seen it and everyone gets it. There's an episode of Seinfeld where Jerry gets a new barber and they use analogy to make it seem like he's having an affair on his old barber. And it's a really <laughs> great scene because the barber notices a hair on him and did you get your haircut by someone else? So they use, all the, they use all the tropes of having an affair, but they map it onto um, haircuts. That's and, very Larry David. <laughs> yeah, Larry David does that a lot. and. Seinfeld does that. The Onion does it constantly in stories. It's a great funny filter. And then there's Madcap, where you're just wacky and silly. It's like physical humor, pratfalls, uh, wacky stuff. Uh, misplaced focus is where you intentionally focus on the wrong thing. And then there's uh, meta humor, which is uh, making fun of humor itself which is really, that's what people like Steve Martin used to do where he would make fun of his act while he was doing his act. Um, and I think that was 11, but I might've missed one. That was 11, I just counted. Oh, it was, okay, great, great. So, so um, well, so what's the, like, so those are the 11. Funny filters is what I call them, yeah. Funny filters. What is like the go-to win funny maker? Yeah, so that's where it gets interesting and people who create comedy are like kids with toys and you can mix and match the funny filters and you can, you can create a, 
a funny filter feedback loop where you have irony upon irony upon irony mixed with hyperbole, mixed with character. And you throw in a little shock and a little mad. It's like a recipe. It's like you're cooking. And the right subject matter is going to suggest the right funny filters sometimes. And so, but for example, if it's shocking subject matter, sometimes the shock funny filter works really well. Or if it's a really important subtext, like you have something that's really going to raise the ire of your audience. Sometimes using misplaced focus is really effective because then you intentionally don't focus on the important thing. You focus on something small and minor and, and maybe made up that just enrages the audience to the point of laughter. It's just like maddening that they're, that you're not talking about the elephant in the room. So great jokes use and great humor uses a lot of the funny filters like you can find uh, we were talking about dave Chappelle earlier and there's a, a sketch that we were talking about the the um the black white supremacist and it uses almost all 11 of the funny filters in that like 10 minute sketch who is blind and doesn't realize that he's right. actually black right so there's the irony upon irony right there there's a lot of shock humor in the sketch because they swear a lot so the reason that there are these 11 is because these are the only 11 ways of making something funny that will be perceived as like a professional caliber joke. We all know humor is subjective and people will laugh at anything, but there's really no guarantee. If you're a professional humor writer and you have to deliver like professional quality jokes, these are the tools that professionals use. And the more you can, the better you get as a chef, <laughs> you know, putting together the funny filters, the funnier the jokes are going to be. That's a great analogy. So, well, let's jump into kind of the, the heart of the conversation here. Fake news is a relatively recent phenomenon, uh, can be defined in a lot of ways, uh, but most often, it's in you, most often it's used to denigrate the press, particularly when the content falls on the other side of the ideological divide. It's almost really more an insult than an assessment of truth. So how do you differentiate between fake news and the kind of satire that The Onion does? Yeah, they're, they, they're all kind of um, bunched together now. But in the beginning, news parody was a type of parody that you could do. You could parody a movie or you could parody um, a newspaper. And The Onion chose to parody a newspaper. Then uh, The Daily Show came about and The Daily Show coined that term fake news in an ad that they did that ran in The Onion <laughs> that was like uh, the leader in fake news was what it said. And it was just a funny, they, it was looked very serious. You know, they played it straight and they showed Jon Stewart at his like anchor desk or whatever. And it was just a funny, cute way to communicate that this was a comedy news show because of The Onion and because of The Daily Show and then The Colbert Report, a whole generation of young people grew up seeing satire only in one format. They only saw it in news parody, even though satire can be in any format you want. We know there are Greek plays that are satirical. There are satirical novels. You know, it's an, just an accident of history that during, in the past you know, 20, 25 years, it's only come through <laughs> news parody. So that term fake news started to be confused with the term satire. So a whole generation of people think satire is jokes that use news headlines to make humor, which it is not. Satire is um, a way to point out human frailty or human foibles or problems in society uh, bringing down authority figures, but doing it humorously in order to communicate that subtextual message about what's wrong with the world. That's what satire is. When those people started doing that fake news on Facebook, that was basically propaganda that they were trying to, trying to trick people into believing things, they labeled that stuff satire because they were victims of that mistake where they thought fake fake news equaled satire. They didn't realize they were doing propaganda. Maybe they did on some level, but they were kidding themselves, lying to themselves saying, oh, it's not propaganda, it's fake news. 
And so in their mind, fake news and satire were similar, but they're not. Uh, so however- if I can just jump ahead here. Is it, is it the intention behind the, the news or the information? Is that what makes them different? The sort of the Absolutely, intention? yeah. So yeah, I'm, I'm getting in the weeds here, but because that propaganda was um, purposeful lies and propaganda, and it was called fake news, and the news parody was also called fake news, those two things got confused. But it's totally different. When you're doing comedy and you're doing a fake news bit, you're a comedian, you're a comedy writer, you're intending to actually educate people about the news, especially on The Daily Show, where they actually tell you what's going on in the news as the context for their jokes. And then the fake news propaganda people are doing the opposite thing, where they're trying to give you misinformation, and they're not even trying to make you laugh. Now, here's where it really gets confused. When people believe a story in The Onion and they think it's true, then people are like, well, you're just like the propaganda. No, 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 because that's not our fault. That's the reader's fault for being stupid and believing that it's real. We gave them every clue they needed that it was fake because it says there in the uh, information on the, in the about page or in the staff box, it says, this is The Onion is a satirical publication. And also you should know better not to believe everything you read and the context of the humor should be such and it should be so crazy and silly that you know it's not real. But we're and in such a, such a contentious time right now and yeah. people are, are scared, they're worried, they're angry. You know, do you expect them to look at the about page for every news organization or information organization that they find information? Yeah, I want them all to be like that student of yours who fact checks everything she reads on the internet because that's what we should be doing. Like at least fact check before you rage respond to something, you know, like I, I, I totally understand somebody reads something and it seems real at first, like have that reaction, get punked, enjoy that experience, but don't write about it. Don't post something until you've actually taken two seconds to, to see if it's real, you know, that's yeah. just a, a news or an internet user being a dummy. Well, um, I want to transition here to, uh, you know, what if people don't understand the intention? They might see the onion, they might even see that this is a satirical paper, but they don't understand what that means. Um, when I was talking to my cousin earlier this week, who should be here, hi Mel, um, about tonight's talk, she said, I love the onion, except when I think it's real and get mad. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I'm sure some of us had the same experience. We know from research, that when people are angry or fearful, their critical thinking skills decline. So even if the intention is to be funny, what are the consequences when the content is misinterpreted? Yeah, I mean, I, I do think that it is the audience's responsibility to um, deal with their feelings. Like it's not my problem <laughs> if your cousin gets angry. <laughs> Now it is my problem if the humor that I've created is so subtle that it seems real or there's nothing fantastical about it. There's nothing impossible about it. Like humor should be, uh, should be obviously funny and silly and wacky. So you immediately see it and know that it's funny. There should be a, a slight hesitation in the onion because it's presented as real news where it's funny because it's played straight but yeah, it's my fault if the humor is so subtle that it could be mistaken as real. Like that to me is a failure in the joke. The joke wasn't funny enough if she's getting angry. But if the joke is funny enough and most people are getting the joke pretty quickly, then it's her fault for um, not either knowing the context, like the real news behind the story, if it's a play on a news story, or just having enough sense to know that, oh, well, this couldn't possibly be true. Well, that's, that's a, a good segue to another set of questions I have. It is, uh, what news sources have been your favorite for adapting real news into satire? Like, who are your go-to sources? For, Where do I go to get real news? To get the real news that you turn into satire. The other question is, where yeah. do you go to get your real news? But there's two, two sides. Where do you go to get yeah. the news that's great material? And where do you go to get the news that, as one of our uh, uh, registrants asked and when they registered for the event, um, as Stephen put it, what's your Walter Cronkite source of news? So what's your like onion source of news for good 
content and right. Walter Cronkite for good actual real news. Yeah, I would say if I had to pick one, I would say it's the AP for Onion News Stories because they're the most conservative. They're not going to be publishing something that they haven't fact checked and they aren't necessarily competing for ratings. Like the last place I would go is TV cable news because they're just competing for ratings. They're just entertainment shows. That's why they show so many fires and riots. Even when there aren't fires and riots going on, they'll play the footage because they know that people <laughs> are gonna get riled up from that and it's gonna be good for their ratings. So, however, I might also look at Fox News, MSNBC, CNN to see what their like 24 hour news cycle story is because that's probably how most people get their news. So at least you're speaking the same language and playing off of what people think is the news. But for the 24 hour news cycle, there's usually like one big story that everybody's talking about. And it's usually, you know, pretty factual. It's somebody did something and they're, maybe they're on tape doing it or whatever. The real problem is in sort of the, the broader news, like, or the broader editorial decisions. What are they choosing to focus on? What topics are they not talking about? And for those, like you do need some alternative news sources to know what's happening in other countries, for example. You're never gonna hear about that on cable news. Um, what's happening with climate change? Like, unless there's a big fire, you're not gonna hear about it because it's a boring, you know, not very visual story. Or uh, erosion of rights, you know, any sort of like long-term story. And you know, a show like John Oliver's show last week tonight, they're going to drill in on some of those bigger stories, net neutrality, climate change, you know, Black Lives Matter. They're, they're going to talk about those things and dissect those things. And The Onion is going to do stories about those things. So you just kind of have to do a little of both and have kind of a, um, a broad, uh, wide palette uh, to get all your various news sources so you can talk about things people may not know about that you can sort of educate them about with subtext, obviously. We never, you know, in comedy, you always just want to entertain. You don't want to educate. Um, and you also want those big news stories that everybody's heard about that you can make fun of or whatever. So, but for my own, for my own news, um, I don't watch cable news. I don't have cable. I, I, I don't even like when they come up on YouTube, like they're automatically fed to me because they're, uh, YouTube is favoring the the mainstream establishment news. It just makes me sick because it's just, in my mind, it's just corporate propaganda is all that mainstream news is because they're all owned by big corporations. And so they, all the news people are hired to perpetuate their corporate agenda. And there's really no real news on there. So for real news, I like um, uh, The Intercept, I think is great. They do great journalism. Uh, Ken, Ken Klippenstein does great journalism. Uh, I like uh, Democracy Now. I think that's a great show. And I watch The Young Turks. And I like those organizations because they aren't corporate owned. And also they let, they let you know their bias. Like on Fox News, they pretend that they're not conservative and they don't reveal their bias. And it's absurd. Like we all know their bias. But The Young Turks are progressive and they'll tell you that. And I appreciate that. And they'll have conservative guests on, you know, so like it's really important to know what people's agenda is, who's funding them, because that, that has everything to do with like what topics are they choosing to report on, you know? Right. That's exactly what I tell my students is I usually use the term diversify your news media portfolio. Absolutely. Um, sure you're looking at a lot of different sources. And yeah, if a source is going to tell you if it's biased or not, that's a, a bonus. I mean, people, a lot of people don't realize that the history of media in this country, news media in this country is a history of openly biased media, party backed newspapers, and um, that the professionally professionalization of news is a relatively recent phenomenon from the early 20th century. So um, it was the fairness doctrine that tried to do equal time. Mm -hmm. And then Reagan got rid of that. So we saw the rise of things like Fox News and um, the, nobody had to worry about equal time anymore. 
But I think journalism had it instilled in it that, well, we should still like try to just be referees and not actually communicate what we think the truth is. We right. should just we should show this crazy person's opinion and we should show this crazy person's opinion and we're out of it. You know, you right. decide like that. What, how in, that's not informative at all. Right. No, I, I definitely understand what you're saying. Like I teach about the objectivity norm in, um, in, in, in my media classes about how objectivity is really, it's not attainable. Like there's no way to ever be completely objective. And so I think no. in some ways we have to acknowledge like, okay, yeah, I have a subjective point of view, but I'm going to talk to people with lots of different points of view. Um, so let me move on a little bit here. Um, in my other role uh, outside of running the speaker series, um, as a scholar of political communication, I've done some research that concludes that political satire does not necessarily depress the vote or turn citizens into cynics. We talked about this the other day. Um, in fact, such content, sat political satire, can do the opposite. It can, can engage people even more in politics. So I can explain this with my professorial hat, uh, but I'm wondering what you think of that. Like, why do you think we have found such effects? Yeah, I mean, I was not privy to that. Like, my job has always been to just create that political satire and hope that on some level it was communicating. It, uh, my first hope was that it was entertaining people. My second hope was that it was turning them into more critical thinkers so they wouldn't just believe everything they saw or read. That's like my, my mission with The Onion if I had to state an actual mission. Funny first, make people critical thinkers second. And so I guess it makes me glad that maybe they did enough critical thinking to realize, oh, I should, I should vote because maybe it matters. Well, um, and I should say it's particularly among young people um, yeah. where I found this phenomenon. And I'll put my professorial hat on. Um, where, it, where the effects happen is through something called political efficacy, where um, watching programs like that not only not doesn't decrease people's feelings that they can have an impact that they can have make a difference but it actually makes them feel more so and i think your example of john oliver is a really good one because he engages in political satire but also has direct calls to action right. for people to engage yeah and that um i credit him greatly uh with that um in that um the way he's advanced satire into activism. I think that's amazing. Um, to, I would never have d thought of that or done that because to me, it's crossing a line. I always just want to entertain and leave it up to the audience to like decide what they do with that. Um, but I admire it. Like, I think it's a, I think it's a, a wonderful way to uh, evolve what satire can be. It's, it is fascinating to see the kind of trajectory from, you know, Mad Magazine to The Onion to The Daily Show to The Colbert Report, which is very mm -hmm. much about parody, um, yep. and to John Oliver. Um, well, let's, let's switch gears a bit. So um, we all know we're living in a somewhat unusual time. Uh, one of my students from National Agenda, who you met earlier, Eleni, wants to know, what real news headlines have you seen lately that seem to be straight out of The Onion? But aren't. Oh yeah, I saw one the other day, but I don't remember what it was. Like I, I should have committed it to memory. Um, or just an example. Yeah, no, like any, any, anything that um, um, some of the things that Trump does are pretty crazy that we've not seen in our lifetime. And I wrote a book called Trump's America. Buy this book, and Mexico will pay for it where we had a lot of, it was, a, it was written in 2015, and it was a citizen's guide for how, how to be an American when Donald Trump is president. And there was a lot of stuff in there that we made up and we thought was really silly and crazy and stupid that has come to pass. And we even made fake newspaper clippings from the future showing him doing things. Like one of them was, um, it was a parody of the New York Times and the clip was something like um, president uh, launches anti-presidential discrimination uh, league or something like that. And he, he literally has talked about 
just presidential discrimination. Like who would have ever thought that the president could turn himself into a victim <laughs> of discrimination? Because um, when we thought of it, we thought it was just crazy and silly. Um, but that's an example of a, a comedy article coming true. What I'm saying is when I see headlines about Trump sometimes, when they're just so out there, it does seem to me like something that The Onion could have written, like often. Before the Trump presidency, were there ever moments you had like that, where you were like, yeah, that looks like something they could have written? Only on the fringe. And, you know, Trump is kind of a fringe figure. He rose out of the Tea Party, which was a fringe movement of the Republican Party. And, yeah, so people on the, on the fringes, whether they were like the hippy-dippy communist left or just the, the sort of radical moolah, um, you know, Ted Cruz type people on the right, like the extreme religious right, um, that's where you'd get most of your humor. And it seems like, at least as far as the right goes, that stuff is now, has now been mainstreamed. Well, um, reflecting back on the theme of our program this year, which is we are the people, uh, what role does satire play in democracy with the First Amendment like ours? You talked to our class a little earlier about um, what satire looks like in other countries. So I just want to ask, how does satire look different in other countries compared to the United States? Yeah, I mean, I don't know too much about it because I'm an American and I, I never leave my house. <laughs> but I know that in a lot of countries, you can't make fun of the government. And there are people who've tried to develop satirical websites and publications in China and Iran and they, and they get shut down. So it's different in that respect in that we have the right to make fun of political figures. And that was another thing about Trump that was new. Well, it was, it was partly new. Before Trump, most presidents would um, laugh politely when they were made fun of on SNL or in The Onion or whatever. But it didn't start with Trump, it started with George W. Bush. Remember how he stood or sat stone-faced when Stephen Colbert did his correspondence dinner speech, making fun of him. That was the first time I'd ever seen that. And a lot of people may not know this, but George W. Bush, his, his White House sent The Onion a cease and desist order uh, to make us stop doing this parody of his weekly radio address that we were doing uh, in the mid 2000s. And that was also new. You know, every president before them would invite the person who did the impression of them on SNL to the White House and, and they'd, you know, he, he does me better than me. You know, they'd do that same joke. But that with Bush, it started to be a thing where he got mad. And then Trump took it to a whole new level where He's so thin skinned that he just doesn't want to be made fun of in any capacity and he'll find you. And then we did another story about Trump before he was president that Michael Cohen, his attorney, was on us constantly about retracting it or he would sue. And he the called same Michael Cohen? the same Michael Cohen. He, um, he sent a, a cease and desist letter and he called and followed up repeatedly. I will say, however, that some of those calls I don't think we're Michael Cohen. Be and even the letter may not have been Michael Cohen. Like, I think Donald Trump wrote the letter and signed it Michael Cohen because it had a lot of Donald Trumpish words in there. It was like, this is a disgrace. Uh, you know, this is disgraceful. Uh, <laughs> it just, you look back and you realize, because remember that story about Trump calling People Magazine and pretending to be his publicist and compl saying that he had all these uh, great uh, loves uh, and had sex with all these women. Um, it occurred to me that why wouldn't he have done that at The Onion? Like why pay Michael Cohen when he could do it? Um, so I think it's possible that Donald Trump himself was calling The Onion to get us to stop making fun of him before he was president, before he was president. So yeah, that's all, that's all very, that's very new and it's very particular to America because of the situation that we're in right now. But then, so we're free to do that with that little exception. In other countries, like I was talking about France and Charlie Hebdo, where their satire goes so far beyond what you would consider tasteful, where in America, you wouldn't publish that at all because you'd be afraid of alienating your entire audience. 
but there they revel in like how offensive can we get and it seems like that type of comedy is embraced uh at least in france um and you know the british have a a storied history of satire and we got a lot of kudos from satirists in um, the uk when the onion was becoming well known they were like oh we didn't realize you americans could do satire (laughs) that felt pretty good but um yeah i I don't know too much about uh satire uh, anywhere else well, before I move on, I will just recommend, um, if you haven't seen it or if our audience hasn't seen it, there's a great documentary from 2016 called Tickling Giants. Um, it's about uh, Bassem Youssef, who uh, was a, basically became the Daily Show of Egypt. Um, it's an incredible story. It's really fascinating. So let me move on a little bit. We're in the context of a national crisis, I would say. And I was thinking about 9-11. And I remember after 9-11, comedy was definitely not on people's minds. I remember thinking, how are SNL and The Onion going to cover this? Um, And I know you weren't editor at that time, but I wanted to read a few of those headlines from that time. So here's one. Not knowing what else to do, woman bakes American flag cake. Hijackers surprised to find selves in hell. We expected, quote, we expected eternal paradise for this, say suicide bombers. And then this one, hugging up 76,000%. So many Americans had never seen such a tragic event unfold before their eyes. And a lot of the comedy that followed, like in these headlines, centered on American patriotism and resilience. I actually lived in Chicago at the time and remember seeing American flags everywhere, cars, buildings, construction sites. The response to COVID and the many other crises facing us today has, let's just say, not been at all the same. A lot of the humor, and I'm thinking of Randy Rainbow's uh, videos and various political cartoons, are darker, uh, sometimes insulting, sometimes crude. So I'm curious, you've been through both of these events. What's different from 9-11-2001 to 9-16-2020? Has comedy changed? Have Americans changed? Why don't we see a similar pattern of comedians sort of rallying around the flag? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. And I think I know the answer. I think what it is, is that humans are really good at dealing with instant problems. We're terrible at dealing with long-term problems. Our brains aren't made for that. We evolved to run away from a, a saber-toothed tiger. We didn't evolve to solve climate change or combat a virus. And you can see that happening in the culture, like the infectious disease experts knew what to do, but a lot of the political leaders were like, well, we can't do that because it wouldn't look good or whatever. So it was handled very poorly. Uh, Trump himself wouldn't wear a mask. A lot of people think the virus is a hoax. And it's because it's a long-term problem. Humans are just not built for that. If some random country bombed us and killed 100,000 people, you would see all the flags and everything else. I would even say this, if some random country uh, was known to have sent an agent into New York City with a suitcase with a virus in it that killed 100,000 people, same thing. You would see American flags, you'd see never forget, et cetera, et cetera. It's because it was slow. Mm And because we had to do preventative things to stop it, that it's simply not registering as the same type of event in our minds. So how does that explain the difference between Americans and the responses of say the Chinese and the Italians? It's a great question. And I think I know the answer to that one too. Or like the South Koreans or like anybody who handled it really well, their governments are working our governments are not, our government is not working. And the reason their governments are working is because they're science-based. They actually listen to scientists and they do what they're supposed to do, even though it doesn't seem like the most politically expedient thing to do. Our system here is built on incentivizing politicians to do the most politically expedient thing, to get reelected or whatever. And 
in some of those other countries, they actually, uh, and I, I know I'm saying something very radical. I'm saying America is not number one. I'm saying we're, we're like number 40 something when it comes to dealing with COVID. But Maybe even worse than that. If, but they, if I can, if I can yeah, go ahead, go ahead. I teach a course on technology and politics and I taught it in the spring. Some of my students in National Agenda were in that class. We started the, the semester by talking about, oh my gosh, the Chinese government is requiring people to download this app on their phones that says whether or not they have the potential of being sick with the COVID virus. And I was like, oh my gosh, you guys, can you imagine this happening in the United States? Well, I'll just tell you today, our university and our state released an app that does exactly that. So, and so it's like you you struggle with this because at the, at the same time we have the First Amendment that protects freedom of speech. You know, China is not a government that protects freedom of speech at all. Um, well, it's a totalitarian government. Right. So it, I, it's kind of I find myself in this weird situation where I'm like, do wait, is, was that a good idea or is that a bad idea? Like, what do we lose when we, you know, adopt these more authoritarian or totalitarian methods of government like yeah well that's an better. argument about covid that i don't understand like during world war ii which uh i believe killed fewer americans than covid has killed if i'm not mistaken um americans were asked to make all kinds of sacrifices and they were happy to make them they you know they did uh rubber drives and they you didn't eat meat on, you know, on Wednesday, so there was more meat for the troops and all this stuff. And now the sacrifices we're being asked to make are so small, like wear a mask, you know, don't go, don't go to a bar. It's like, I, I don't know, uh, maybe it's just that we're a spoiled series of generations now, or what it is. But I, I, th I think you had something in what you said earlier is that there's just, if there's an easy them to blame, um, it, it helps us rally around the flag better. And I think, you know, Absolutely. with these complicated issues like a virus, um, it's just not easy to... Yeah, and I think that's, that's, why Trump, that's why Trump tried to blame the Chinese and still tries to do that, because he knows that that's, that's the main line to the, the uh, brain stems of most voters. It's like, oh, if I can just find a them to pin it on, um, that'll make sense to them that's what works in our brains. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, I'm going to ask my, um, my folks on the, the uh, backstage here to start uh, identifying some questions from our audience. Um, I've been seeing the chat questions coming in. If you still have a question you'd like to submit, please submit that to the chat. Uh, and we'll be hopefully able to ask your question for you. One of my students uh, will be asking questions for the audience members. So um, I'm going to uh, jump on this Trump message for a second here. And one of my students, Lauren, uh, she wanted to know, I'm sorry, one of our audience members, Lauren, not my student, she uh, submitted this question via the registration. She wanted to know if the Trump administration has been bad or maybe good for comedy. Well, it was good for me. I mean, I, I sold my book about Trump I self-published it before he got elected. And then when he got elected, a publisher sought me out to, um, to publish it. And so that's been good. <laughs> um, and I think a lot of comedians would say he's been good. You know, obviously a lot of those late night guys like Seth Meyers and Stephen Colbert, all they talk about is Trump. So like, I remember way back in the nineties when I first was becoming aware of, uh, like the, the fact that the onion might have an impact on people's thinking. I started thinking like it was the Dole Clinton election of 96. And I was like, well, Dole is funnier. Should I vote for Dole because he's funnier? Or should <laughs> I vote for uh, Clinton who, even though, you know, he's kind of a, a corporate establishment Democrat, I agreed with more of his policies. Um, so comedians talk about that. Like, voting for the funnier <laughs> politician or whatever. But the thing is like Clinton was hilarious. Like he was a great foil for comedy. So nobody lost anything from that. Like whoever's in charge, an authority figure is just a natural, no matter who they are. 
they're always a, a great target for satire. So yeah, it, it doesn't really matter. And, and um, Trump obviously mixed bag, like any of them. Well, that reminds me of something you said earlier today, which um, maybe you can explain in a little bit more detail, is you kind of discovered over the course of doing satire that you wanted to afflict the comfortable and comfort the afflicted. So sort of target the people who are in power and protect the people who are not in power. Could you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, I learned that that's what works with audiences. If you're picking on the down, downtrodden, audiences don't like that. They get really uncomfortable. And it, that's the kind of humor that gets groans or it feels very political and it feels malicious. But if you're picking on the establishment or authority figures of any kind, even minor authority figures, like audiences love that. You can do that all day long it's very cathartic for them. Even in a free society like America where we can criticize our leaders, they're still our leaders and they're still in charge and we still pay taxes to them. So it feels really good to make fun of them. And not just leaders and you know the establishment, but any sort of tradition or anything that's like an established control over us. Like the onion has always enjoyed making fun of like religions and societal conventions, you know, traditions, holidays, just like you name it, any of that stuff. Um, and for, you know, most comedy writers are kind of like misanthropes to a certain degree. So there's, there's plenty of things to find in society that we feel like are trying to control us. And so we want to lash out at them. And that's where that comes from. That phrase comes from journalism, actually, um, from like the the uh, activist journalism of the 1930s, that hmm. journalism should comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, as we're, we're seeing, we're getting a lot more questions coming in, um, but I have one final question for you before we switch over to the Q&A. And because I think about um, the, kind of the early beginnings of The Onion when, was when I was in college and I remember um, what the internet looked like in the mid to late 1990s. And so The Onion was a presence in the early halcyon days of the internet. No one imagined what it would be today or that we'd be doing virtual speaker series or <laughs> virtual classrooms. Um, couldn't have imagined that. So what do you see as the biggest differences in publishing satire on the internet in the 1990s compared with now, or just differences in online content in general? Because it was a much more open space in the 90s. People were able to publish in a way that they aren't necessarily able to today because of the corporatization of many of the online platforms. So I'm just curious if you could reflect on that difference a little bit. There's, there are many differences. Most people get their information on the internet through Facebook. And so having a website is not really that important. <laughs> Whereas when The Onion started, it was the first and only humor website. And so there weren't a lot of websites to go to. And it was a really fortuitous time for us to be in that place. Having been a print publication for a few years, we were ready to go online. And people came to our website and you would sell advertising based on how many people viewed your website that's not really how it works anymore because people are looking at your stories on Facebook or whatever. That's definitely different in terms of like the corporatization, like Facebook is kind of the corporation or Google and then all the other corporate, like the big wigs on, on the internet are technically on a level playing field with everybody else. So you could go to, you know, a small humor website that nobody's ever heard of just as easily as you could go to, you know, the, um, NBC uh, website or whatever. So that hasn't really changed, but it's a much crowded, much more crowded space. You know, it's like there's a billion websites that you could go to. Uh, the other thing is like in the beginning of the internet, we weren't interactive. We just took what we did in print and we just put it online. And we did that for years. We actually didn't change that until about 2012. <laughs> we finally decided, all right, we should, maybe release one story a day instead of just dumping everything on, on a Wednesday, which is kind of how we did it. We didn't care. And you know, what's this Twitter everybody's talking about? We should get on Twitter and tweet out our stories. And so 
it's be, it's become more of like a multi-platform thing where you you have to kind of deluge the space to get your word out um and obviously the bandwidth is another thing like we couldn't do video we couldn't do audio in those days um, sure. that's that's different yeah a lot of things it was just an experimental new way to distribute the onion in the 90s is all it was and i never imagined that it would be like the only thing eventually and the biggest thing well i still remember i worked at my college radio station and i remember we had you know one computer in our office and we would all crowd around it and look at what the most recent That's onion headlines funny. um because you know funny. nobody had their own personal computers you oh, right, right right um so all our right. computer had 16 um megabytes of ram our first onion computer <laughs> remember that and photoshop yeah. didn't have layers so if you wanted to do a uh, one of those altered photos, you'd have to do this option erase tool. It was like the, <laughs> the only way you could do it. Crazy. Yeah, we, we, we went, walked to school uphill and in snow, both oh, ways. Oh, <laughs> stop. <laughs> All right. So we're doing the Q&A, as I mentioned, a little differently this year. Some folks on our end have been reading through all of your great questions that you've been submitting in the chat. And uh, for each question, question chosen, one of my students in the National Agenda class will read that question. So if we are ready to go, I'm going to ask my folks if we are ready to go, send me something in the chat. It's just about 8.30, which is our time for our Q&A. All right, we are ready. So I'm going to toss our first audience question to our student, Jillian. Jillian, it's your, you're up. So Debbie Gauntz from Oxford, Pennsylvania has a question regarding your background. She wants to know why you have a picture of Trump hanging behind you for inspiration. Oh, that um, was a gift to me from the writers of uh, the other writers who I worked with on that, that book, Trump's America, buy this book and Mexico will pay for it. It's a Photoshop um, job that they made where it shows Trump holding a copy of the book and it's signed by him and they scanned his handwriting so it looks like his actual handwriting. And it says, Scott, this book is a disaster, Donald Trump. <laughs> and they presented that to me as a gift at the book release party and it was uh, so touching that I hung it up. <laughs> <laughs> I bet a signature is not very hard to replicate. No, they, they scanned it. So, oh. uh, but it, it look, they did a great job. It looks just like his handwriting. I'm going to... You can see that there. I see. It's inspiring. Yeah, and now it's gone. I'm not going to hang it back up. <laughs> All right, well, let's jump to our next question. This is from one of my students. His name is John. Uh, Shannon Polson from Columbus, Ohio asked, what do you think about categorizing satire by its features? Like if it, if it has all the linguistic, linguistic components of a joke instead of intention, do you get it? Instead of a what? Uh, she said, what do you think about categorizing satire by its features? Like if it has all the linguistic components of a joke instead of intention. Oh, instead of intention. I see. I should yeah, mention that this ahead. particular student is one of our alumni and a graduate student who is studying satire, fake news, and misinformation, so. Yeah. It's a, it's a really interesting question, and I, I think I'm coming down really hard on one side of it, and that is that I think intention is everything. I th because there's a, a phenomenon in comedy that doesn't have a name, I should name it, where you know that real life is always going to be funnier than anything you could create. Like Aunt Myrtle slips and falls into the baby pool. Um, it's always going to get a laugh and it's always going to be funnier than the funniest joke that the funniest writer's room of funny writers could come up with working all day. That's just the nature of the beast. And so the audience always needs to know what's real and what's made up. So like on a reality TV show, 
they they need to know that those are real people captured on the street saying real people things. And that's what makes them funny. If they knew that, like for one of those segments, let's say on the Tonight Show where they'll interview somebody on the street. Those are funny because people know those are real people. If it was performed, it wouldn't be as funny and the jokes would have to be different because people have a different expectation when it's crafted comedy. So I don't count something that has all the features of satire as satire. I categorize it as an accident and something in real life that just happens to be funny. Hmm. That's satire has to be crafted. Great, well, thank you for that question. Uh, our next question comes from our, um, what I'm calling them my audience surrogates. They're sort of representing our audience. Uh, Chloe has a question about Joe Biden. Hi. Um, so Ken Grant from Delaware has a question. Um, he wants to know, what inspired the Onion's portrayal of Vice President Biden with a trans am and t-shirt guy? Are there any plans to run that same theme again? Well, I'm no longer with the Onion, but I was there when we were doing that. And I was there and oversaw the project that we did that was um, a book written by Joe Biden called The President of Vice when he was vice president. And it sort of took that whole persona of him being sort of like a rust belt dirt bag and drilled into it, told his whole life story and everything. The Onion has always had a history of, of kind of characterizing a, a political figure in a certain way, always trying to pick a character trait that's different than what everyone else is doing. Vice presidents especially, Typically in comedy, they always get the same character traits applied to them. And those character traits are, they are boring and uh, invisible. That's how people have always made fun of vice presidents. So with Biden, it stems from who he is and where he's from and how he talks. The Onion often does this type of character humor where we hyperbolize someone's actual character traits to invent a new character so that those traits kind of ring true. So he is from the Rust Belt. You know, you can believe that he would be that type of character um, because he has this kind of mischievous smile. Um, why wouldn't he be like this creepy uncle uh, sort of character? Um, and I, I love that character. And Chad Knackers, who is now the editor in chief of The Onion, that character was his creation back during the Obama years. Do you think he, that Biden wears the aviators like because of that onion piece or that? Well, onion he, piece? Lo he loves the, those parodies and he tweeted out uh, the book when we wrote about it. And then Obama retweeted that tweet. That felt pretty good. Um, but yeah, he loves it. He's the old fashioned type of president that enjoys when he's made fun of. Um, he doesn't get insulted. Wow, I don't know if that was a Freudian slip there, but you just called him an old fashioned type of president. <laughs> oh yeah, I meant political figure. <laughs> I actually think Trump is gonna win. Do you really? I do, yeah. And I thought he would win in 2016 as well. I'm, I, when I was promoting my book throughout the summer of 2016, everybody asked me and I was like, oh, he's gonna win, he's gonna win. Um, wow. And cause he'll like, he'll come out with a, vi of, um, a vaccine uh, on November 2nd, <laughs> he'll figure out something. Like he's, he's yeah. a winner. I can't feign to pretend that I can predict anything anymore. <laughs> All right. Yeah, no, it's not, a, it's not a good business to get into. Cause like no. I, pre I predicted a lot of things and I'm wrong a lot more than I'm right. But when you're right a few times, people start thinking you're a prognosticator. So I'll go with that. <laughs> All right, well, we have another question uh, from our audience surrogate. Uh, Autumn, who has a question relating to political divides. Hello. Hello. Uh, Hill asks, many observers believe that humorists tend to be center left. Why can't conservative Republicans mock progressives in a funny way? This is a great question, Scott. Um, it was one that I had for you that I didn't get to ask. So yeah, talk a little bit about this kind of divide between uh, liberals and conservatives in terms of being funny and what works and what doesn't. Yeah, it's definitely a phenomenon where almost all the satirists I know are about as far left as you can get. Um, 
and still, you know, be a functioning member of uh, a capitalist society. None of them are communists, <laughs> but they're very progressive. And there's a reason for that. Progressives want to make the world a better place. They, they want to progress. They want human beings to take care of each other. And that's what satirists want. And the reason those people work as satirists and Republicans don't is because audiences want that as well. Audiences want people to be uplifted. They want people who are downtrodden to be taken care of. It's that whole comfort the afflicted thing that I was talking about. That's just a law of nature when it comes to audiences. We were talking about that Fox News comedy show that they tried to do where they just made fun of immigrants and welfare mothers and it just turned audiences' stomachs. Even right-wing audiences don't want to hear that. It feels wrong to make fun of the downtrodden or to blame them for problems. It feels so much better to aspire to do better and to bring down our political leaders, like whatever party they may be in, you know, because there's no progressive party. Like the Democrats and the Republicans are, um, the Democrats are kind of center, center right and the Republicans are far right. That's where the country is right now. And they don't allow progressives on TV because they're anti-corporate and TV is owned by corporations. So humorists kind of fill that gap and they are that voice of the far left, um, which is fine. Like where else is that voice gonna get through? It's not gonna get through in uh, traditional media. But yeah, that's just the reality of it. It's very strange. Conservative comedians typically do not do political humor. They'll do relationship humor or family humor. I'm thinking of like uh, Jeff Foxworthy or Larry the Cable Guy or stuff like that. Dennis Miller did that too. He just did like um, funny intellectual comedy. When he came out as a progressive, suddenly he lost his HBO show and he became a right-wing radio host. His career just plummeted. Um, audiences don't want to get comedy from conservatives. And I think it has, you know, they've done those tests you were talking about, Lindsay, about uh, how fear makes you less of a critical thinker. They've done tests where people on the right have um, a much more active, is it the amygdala where, where the fear is? They're, they're afraid of immigrants, they're afraid of uh, enemies um, because their tribe, their circle is the nation, they're nationalist thinkers. Whereas progressives think of their tribe as humans, you know, the entire earth. So we don't have the same fear of the other that Republicans have. So um, yeah, we can, we can get into all this stuff. These are obviously just my theories, but I've been in the business a long time and I've seen them uh, acted out in practice. And that's literally just the way it is. Well, and uh, yeah, I'd like to mention this point too, that, you know, we do feature opinions uh, and speakers who have opinions on this, on this program. Um, we are a nonpartisan center. We offer uh, op opinions from all sides, but I might take this moment just to uh, shout out uh, my friend, good friend and colleague, uh, Danigal Young, just published a book this year that Scott, I think you might be really interested in. It's called Irony and Outrage, the Polarized Landscape of Rage, Fear and Laughter in the United States. And she points out that uh, that the type of entertainment that people consume on the left and the right differs, that one genre on the left is guided by ambiguity, play, deliberation, and openness, while the other is guided by certainty, vigilance, instinct, and boundaries. So it's a great read. I highly encourage- That sounds like my kind of thing. And I just want to say one more thing about that, that to me, this right-left dichotomy is- um, is a false dichotomy because, like I said, Democrats, what, what Republicans call the left in this country is center, center right. It's like, that's what most Democrats are. And um, there's, there's no left, right battle. The, the battle that satirists are interested in is the haves and the have nots battle because that's a real that's a, that's a real struggle in society. That's, you know, a historical struggle between proletariat and bourgeoisie. So in this country, it's the 99% against the 1%. So somebody like Bernie Sanders is going to be maligned as, you know, the radical left, 
by all of these mainstream Democrats and Republicans because they're center, center right, far right. But when you poll people, most people like have a very high opinion of Bernie Sanders' actual policy ideas. They want Medicare for all. They want a living wage. They don't want um, needless wars. You know, so and they. Um, by thinking of the political balance in this country as between the 99% and the 1% is how satirists think of it. And that's how you can find stupidity anywhere on the political spectrum, left and right, and come off as an equal opportunity offender, which is what I always tried to do at The Onion, when you know that you're playing the smarter game, that you're appealing to the 99%, um, and you're making fun of the 1%. Like that's a winning formula for somebody who's trying to build an audience. You know, If you're trying to build an audience by appealing only to the left or only to the right, you're just chopping yourself in half and there's no point in that. Hmm. Interesting. All right, well, we have another question uh, from our audience surrogate, Camilla. She has a question about possible post-Trump humor. Hi, Scott. So I have a question from Mary Miller, and her question is, if there is a change of administration in November, how do you imagine comedy will pivot to new topics? Based on how I've seen it happen before, you know, satirists, because they're left-leaning, tend to go after Republicans a lot harder. And when there's a boring Democratic president in office, they'll make fun of that president's personality much more than they'll make fun of their policies, even when their policies like deserve just as much ridicule as a Republican president's policies. That's how it was with Clinton. That's how it was with Obama. You'd make fun of Clinton for having the affair. You wouldn't make fun of Clinton for NAFTA. That's just kind of how it worked. And you'll probably see comedy move away from political comedy because the mainstream media is also very biased toward the establishment Democrats. So they aren't pointing out a lot of the outrages. Like when you think about all of the outrages that the media is going after Trump for, uh, Obama had just as many outrages, but they didn't go after them because he's like on their team. So therefore the audience for late night comedy shows, for example, didn't hear those stories. So somebody like Seth Meyers or Jimmy Kimmel isn't gonna find much hay making fun of uh, stories that the media isn't talking about. So it's kind of this, um, this pile on effect. If the media is talking about a big story, the comedy people are gonna talk about it because they know everybody knows about it. But if nobody's talking about the story, let's, let's take drone strikes, for example, like Obama started doing the thing where we would just send out these drones to kill random people. New thing, had never been done before. It's extrajudicial. It violates the Geneva Convention. But he was Obama, so the media never said anything about it. They're like, let him pass. You know, he's cool <laughs> or whatever. Um, if they had talked about it, if it had been a story, then the comedians would have talked about it because they would have known, oh, my audience knows about that. It's something I should talk about. Well, this is something interesting too. You, uh, recently in uh, May of last year, you wrote an article for Medium that just said eight ways to keep your satire writing fresh in a comedy saturated world. I thought this yeah. was really interesting because you're basically saying like, don't pay attention to the big stories. Um, look at something totally different. It doesn't even have to be about current events. So what's some advice for people who want to be like the next funny person on Twitter? Yeah, well, my main advice would be to do something totally original that you don't see anyone else doing because that's the type of comedy that always breaks through. So when The Onion started, nobody else was doing fake news. That's why we broke through. Now, so many people start a humor publication, they do fake news. And that's the first thing I tell them is don't do that. <laughs> so, you know, there are so many unique and crazy Twitter identities and Twitter feeds that people have tried. And some of the really unique ones have blown up and those people have gotten plucked out and hired for comedy jobs. Um, it's, it's pretty amazing. But yeah, that, the advice I had in that article is like what The Onion used to do where we'd go after evergreen topics. 
if you do do current events humor, I certainly would recommend doing it in a different format than news parody. But going after topics that not everybody's talking about, like avoiding the, the big joke, because then, like I always wanna compete in uh, the blue ocean and not the red ocean, if you know that phrase. The red ocean is where all the sharks are and it's crowded and you're gonna get eaten. There's too much competition. Go to the blue ocean where there's nobody and uh, you're gonna do a lot better. It's gonna be a lot easier ride. So blue is in not Democrat and Republican, but as no, in- No, no, it's blood versus, blood versus <laughs> water. Yeah. <laughs> bloody waters versus not bloody waters. Right, right. Okay. Um, all right, we have uh, time for, I think, a couple more questions. So let's go to Jillian. She has a question for you. Tracy Holden asks, in all seriousness, do you think mockery of news by The Onion, Weekend Update, The Daily Show, and others contributed to the devaluing of news and the claims of fake news by public figures? Well, I kind of went into that with my diatribe about um, how fake news, the term fake news was stolen by propagandists for, during the 2016 election. But no, I think it's the responsibility of journalists to do actual journalism. And you don't see that on mainstream TV news anymore. Those people aren't journalists. They're news actors and their shows are entertainment. The only purpose of TV is to get you to keep watching so you can see the ads. That's the only reason TV exists. And like I said, news used to be a public service. A network like NBC used to have the news division, which they would support regardless of advertising dollars with a certain budget because they knew it was a public good that they were providing news and information to, to educate and ha you know, have an informed electorate. We don't have that anymore. CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, all of them, they're out there competing for ad dollars. So they have to sensationalize the news. They have to make it entertaining. And because they're owned by corporations that have an agenda, they have to talk about only the things that the corporation is comfortable with them talking about. So that none of that had anything to do with the comedy that preceded it. The comedy was just given a gift when TV journalism started tanking in the last 20, 30 years and turning into you know, this ridiculous clown show that it is now. So we've got a lot of material to make fun of but I, no, I would not say that news parody is in any way responsible for that. All right. Um, let's see. We've got another question uh, that John is going to ask about the limits of humor. Uh, hello again, Scott. Hello. Uh, I have a question from Paige Lipman, and she asks, are there any topics you refuse to cover? Have you ever questioned something you published and wondered if you went too far? The question, the answer to the latter part of that question is yes, happens all the time, especially in the beginning at The Onion when we didn't know what we were doing, made a lot of mistakes, went too far. And by going too far, I mean, we went too far in afflicting the afflicted, like picking on the wrong target, an undeserving target. And what was the first part of that question again, John? John the first back. part. The first part was: Are there any topics you refuse? Oh, to right, cover? right. Any topics that I refuse to cover? No, there's no, there's no topic that you can't make jokes about. Humor is a universal language. Even if it's something really horrible, there's there's a way to talk about it humorously, and there has to be because humor is the ultimate coping mechanism. And for a comedy writer or a comedian, that's how they see the world. That's how they process life. So they're going to see everything through that lens. And you can't, you can't limit yourself. Um, just it wouldn't be possible. That was a, lot, a question that a lot of my students had is like, what's the limit, but you're kind of saying, if you're afflicting the afflicted, you've crossed the line. Mm. That's it. All right, well, I think we have time for one more question and my student Chloe is going to ask this one. Okay, so Amani Thurman has a question. 
Um, she wants to know, how can contemporary journalism better its integrity, making better distinctions between fake news? Yeah, that's a real problem because there's no incentive. Like, it's kind of like school teachers. Like, we pay them as little as we can possibly get away with. So how do we expect to get great people to go into that profession? All you're going to get is, you know, occasionally you're going to get somebody who loves it so much they don't care that it's poverty wages. And that's kind of how journalism is. It's really easy to sell out in journalism and get a job working for a think tank or a big network and make a ton of money, but then they're going to constrain you and they're not interested in you communicating the truth to your audience. They're interested in you communicating their propaganda. That's, that's what it's all about. It's that whole 1% versus 99% thing. We think it's 50-50, but it's really one against 99 because the 1% control so much of the information that, that we consider to be official information. So the only way for journalists to have integrity is to remove the money from the situation. It's like, if only we could remove money from politics, you'd have more honest politicians. But now because politicians can take so much money in bribes, which they call contributions, campaign contributions, they're just the foot servants of the donors. And they're gonna do what the donors want. They're not gonna do what the 99% want. There was a great study that Princeton University did that showed uh, how, how Congress votes based on what corporations want, like the top 1% want, corporate owners, versus what the rest of the populace, the 99% want. And the chart is, you gotta look this up. It's, it's just such a frightening chart because if you're in the top 1%, there's like a 100% likelihood that Congress will take up your bills and fight for you and pass laws that will help you. But if you're part of the 99%, there's a less than 50% chance that they'll even introduce legislation that will help you in, on the floor of, of Congress. So that's just the world we live in. If we could make journalism somehow not tied to money, if we could just support it as a public good. Um, and that's what a lot of these independent journalists are doing. They're, they have their Patreon or their YouTube channel or whatever. And those people are searching for truth and they're beholden to the people who fund them, who are their viewers. And that's the most honest kind of journalism. I would never trust journalism that came from one of these big companies. There's like seven media companies that own everything. And uh, it's just not reliable More like information. <laughs> More like six. Um, but let's six. not forget okay. public media as well here. I think National Public Radio and um, PBS News are also great resources to go to. You mentioned the BBC. Um, other countries have different models for funding uh, media. So I think you're absolutely right in pointing out the corporatization of most of the media in this country. But yeah. I, technically, they're independent because they're supported by the government, but they're, they have such a clear establishment bias. They're in the bubble of Washington, and they're kind of like trying to, to, they're like the geeks in the high school analogy, and the mainstream media is like the cool kids, and they're just trying to be like the cool kids and cover the same stuff. Um, by and large, I, I, I find um, the public media in this country to be incredibly feckless and bland personally <laughs> on that note uh before we wrap up i wanted to bring attention again to the theme this year which you can see uh virtually behind me we are the people um it's fitting because tomorrow is actually constitution day it commemorates the september 17th 1787 signing of the united states constitution here we are 233 years later in a country that would likely look foreign to many of those who signed this document, foreign interference in our elections, a prolific pandemic, record-breaking wildfires on the West Coast, a citizenry so divided that many people don't listen or even trust, listen to or even trust the other side, and protests amid racial tensions rising. Oh, and then there's the presidential election. So there's lots to discuss this fall, and I hope you'll join me at our next event, which will be a panel looking at how Hollywood portrays Washington. Is it anything remotely like reality? 
How have portrayals of the president changed? And what impact do shows about Washington have on Americans' perceptions of our federal government? So please join me giving a great big thank you to our speaker tonight, Scott Dickers. Thank you so much for being here. It was my pleasure. Thanks so much, Lindsay, for having me. Thanks to everybody who joined tonight for those excellent questions. It's very thought-provoking. Fun to talk about this stuff. And, uh, you know, because I'm uh, quarantined and I never leave my house, like, what, where else do I get an opportunity to just uh, talk about comedy and politics? It's a lot of fun. It was a great conversation. I really appreciate you being here. So thanks to everyone for joining us and good night. Good night. <laughs>